Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to this uh, part of the uh, summer school. It's always uh, a wonderful uh, occasion for me when uh, you see these stages in the, the summer school because it is one of the most important. Uh, sorry, is that is that better? Okay, so now I've got it in the right place. Every year, I'm very excited about the summer school because I think it is one of the most important things that UCT does as a university is to interact with the uh, community around it because I think uh, we all realize in uh, modern times that that is what uh, a university uh, should do. And of course, uh, our team that organized the summer school, Ruby Rao, who is the director, do, as I'm sure you all know, uh, a wonderful job and I'm always so happy when Midi asked me to uh, open some of the courses. So my name is Dani Fisser and I'm one of the Deputy Vice Chancellors uh, of the University. Um, Anwar and I have been colleagues and friends for uh, a very long time. He is a uh, man of many parts. He is uh, the most experienced warden at UCT and for 12 happy years of my life I have also shared that duty uh, with Anwar. So Anwar is uh, in that part of his life is deeply committed to students and to student affairs and he's very heavily involved in, in uh, student affairs in the Faculty of, of Health Sciences and I think it's very fitting that he is ending his uh, illustrious career as the Deputy Vice Chancellor responsible for uh, student affairs and the other, other happy coincidence of that is that the two of us are working together once again. So it is great to be able to introduce uh, a friend and a colleague of, uh, of long standing uh, tonight. Um, now, uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, we've known for a long time that uh, the gut is important. Hippocrates uh, said uh, famously that uh, all disease starts with the gut, but uh, he knew also that it's very important what you what you put into it. So, uh, in the Hippocratic uh, corpus, uh, the chewing of uh, willow bark is, uh, is prescribed to ease uh, fever and, and pain. So, of course, that is a, a good advice, um, since uh, willow bark contains salicin, which is very close to to aspirin and of course a, a really good thing to do. But we, we know a lot more about the gut now than uh, people did in Hippocratic times. And Anwar is one of the people that knows most. Now, Anwar doesn't only know about the gut. Anwar is uh, a polymath. So Anwar is probably the uh, best read person uh, in UCT. And so mostly when we speak, we're talking about which book I should read next, <laughs> which I usually do with, uh, with, with great uh, pleasure. So uh, I think the broad range of, of Anwar's uh, scholarship will become clear in the course of these lectures. Uh, as you will have gleaned from the description in the summer school booklet, he is I think going to invoke evolution and uh, he's going to end with the fascinating notion of uh, the Marcio somatic marker syndrome. So he's going to teach us what a, a gut feeling really is. <laughs> uh, now, Professor Anwar Moore is a professor and senior specialist scientist in the Department of Surgery uh, and he holds a whole string of degrees, he's PhD, uh, from the University of Newcastle in the UK. He is a prolific writer, NRF-rated researcher, and he is a uh, holder of that very rare accolade, a Distinguished Teacher Award at UCT. Anwar, we're looking forward to your lectures. Can you hear me all? 
thank you. Danny, thank you very much. Uh, a little hyperbolic, but thank you. <laughs> and, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought that a topic like the gut would attract uh, so many people. <laughs> but here you are. And um, it's, been, it's been a difficult topic. And I found that at one point, I had 80 slides per talk, and I didn't know how to trim it. So I'm going to do my best. Um, and I'm hoping that if I speak for too long, you'll stop me. You can start yawning. You're welcome to do that. Um, Danny mentioned my stint as Deputy Vice Chancellor. Um, there's a rumor going around, and I hope you don't believe it when you hear it. The rumor says that um, the trouble at UCT started when I arrived into that <laughs> office. So we're going to talk about the gut, its contents and discontents. and. I'm going to give you an overview of the gut. Um, but I first am going to ask, I'm first going to apologize to you, and I'll tell you why. So my theme is the rise, the fall, and the return of the gut. So if you read the summer school brochure, and I'm sure all of you did, it said ultimately the function of the gut is to extract and absorb nutrients from digested food to reach all parts of the body via the bloodstream. And, th and that, of course, keeps us alive. And to expel waste material by defecation. Now, apparently, I was thinking of a word there. And defecation is the biological term for the expelling of waste from our bodies through the gut. And I hear it did raise a few giggles from people who were actually, um, you know, the selection committee who was looking at my submission. Uh, but I, I've got to apologize to you, but there's a serious side to this. Um, we're going to be talking about things that are unsavory. I want to warn you. Um, so if at any time you feel it's getting a bit too much, you can express your feelings in some way or the other, but preferably through the anterior orifice and not through any other. <laughs> now, I just want to tell you that I consulted two textbooks when I, when I prepared for this course. One of them is by Arthur, Arthur C. Guyton. And Guyton, Guyton's textbook I used as an undergraduate. It was first published in the early 70s. But I found, I found it to be beautifully written. I wasn't a very good student, but I think Guyton's writing style helped me understand the subject so well, the subject of physiology. And I was amazed when I came to UCT much later and uh, found that Guyton was going to visit. And he came over. He was in a wheelchair. I hadn't realized that until I saw him. And he gave a lecture for about 40 minutes on, I think it was the kidney. And he spoke just like he wrote, simply, beautifully, to the point. It was really amazing. And um, I just read today that he had died in 2003 in a motor car accident, which was sad. Now, this was the most recent edition of the textbook when I left, when I was about to leave KwaZulu-Natal and move to Cape Town. And some friends were wondering what to buy me for a present, uh, a farewell gift. And then somebody said, you know, Molly is a strange guy. Uh, I, I suggest you ask him what he wants. Because if you buy him something and he doesn't like it, uh, it it's, it's not going to be nice. So they asked me, and I said, I want Guyton's textbook. And, and I, that proved them right, because they knew I had some weird characteristics. So some of them signed it. And if you look closely, one of them said, was it here? May Allah be with you. And I think what he was actually saying is, mate, you need all the prayers in the world because, <laughs> because um, you're very unusual. Anyway, I still have the textbook. And another one I used was the one we use now for medical students doing physiology in the second year, which is human physiology from cells to systems. I thought something was missing. Ah, thanks. OK. Now, so. Over these next few days, you're going to hear a lot of 
uh, sort of, um, you know, titles or the gut called by different name, gut, digestive tract, gastrointestinal tract, gastrointestinal system, alimentary canal. Are they one, uh, one and the same thing? Essentially, yes. Essentially, yes. I, I sort of use these terms interchangeably, but they mean the same thing, and I'll explain. The other term that you will hear is the enteric nervous system. Enteric meaning tube, because the gut is a tube. And the enteric nervous system, or intrinsic nervous system, is one of the main divisions of our nervous systems, and it consists of a mesh-like system of neurons that governs the function of the gastrointestinal system. So in the gastrointestinal system, in the gut, you have these, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. You have these neurons. And what you'll notice is some of them are called sensory and some of them are called motor. Now we refer to those, um, we, we refer to neurons using those terms using that terminology. So if I put my hand on a hot stove, there will be a sensory receptor there and a sensory neuron that will go all the way to my central nervous system, either my spinal cord or even my brain, and say, your hand is on the stove. Can you feel the heat? Withdraw. So that's information coming from the outside to the inside. When I withdraw, that's an instruction going from the central nervous system to the muscles in my arm, which actually move them and move this arm when I withdraw. Now over here, we're not talking about the central nervous system at all. And that tells you, and this is not an old discovery, that tells you that the gut is one region of the body that has its own nervous system. And that's an amazing discovery. And you'll, you'll, you'll get to know why as we proceed. But this is one of my favorite slides. And I always put it up. I think last year I gave a, a series of summer school lectures on the big questions, previously on religion and science. And I really like this slide because I've always been uh, fascinated. In fact, when I first realized it, it was like, like an epiphany that we, everything in, 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 in the universe is made of atoms. And that atoms get together and form molecules and these molecules arrange themselves in a particular way to give you a living thing called a cell. Now the jump from here to there, ladies and gentlemen, would be very, very wide. And we don't know exactly what happens between this and that. But dead matter eventually emerges into life. So something had, new has emerged. So the whole now is more than the sum of its parts. That's absolutely fascinating. And then cells get together, make tissue. And you get a variety of different types of tissue that make organs. So you have a brain, you have a liver, you have a stomach, you have a colon. Those are organs. They're made of cells, but they're not made of identical cells. You'll note that one organ can be made with a variety of different cell types. So now put all those organs together into an organ system. So if you took the brain and the spinal cord, you will get the nervous system. If you took the liver and the stomach and all the other parts of the gut, you get the gastrointestinal system, the gut. That's what we're talking about today. So, there is that difference between organs and organ systems. The system is bigger. The organs are individual units in a system. And then I'm not going to go further, but OK, put all your systems together, and you get me, you, and the cat. And of course, we boast of having a mind and consciousness. Uh, I think my cat has a mind, but I mean, I, I don't have you know, scientific evidence to show, to show that. And then, and then and then, of course, when you, get into that, when you get into that realm of the neurosciences and psychiatry, and then many individuals then get together, form a society, and produce a culture. Okay? But at the end of the day, physics underlies everything. 
Now, my, 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 my friend and colleague, George Ellis, wouldn't like that statement at all. George Ellis would say, physics, physics causes most of it, but not all of it. Uh, and I, we haven't discovered the other factor that's missing. So, an organ in perspective. In biology, an organ is a collection of tissues joined in a structural unit to serve a common function. Tissues, as I said, in turn, are made of cells. Several types of tissues constitute an organ. And an organ, such as the stomach, is a part of a system, in this case, the gastrointestinal system. And then you have various systems, gastrointestinal, nervous, circulatory, renal. And they work in harmony to form an organism, for example, a lion or a human being. So an organ, any organ, if you took it out of the body and placed it on the table, it would die. So to function, an organ must have a blood supply so that nutrients and oxygen can reach it. It must have a nerve supply so that there is a two-way communication system between it and the spinal cord and brain. In that way, the brain will always know what the state of the organ is at any one time. And of course, organs have a hormonal supply, usually provided by the endocrine system. So if you look at it in perspective, here is your gut. Oops, oops, I'm kidding. Here is your gut from your mouth right down to the large intestine and out into the anus. Okay, And it's a long tube. And you can see the different parts of the gut. Um, and the, I have more pictures to show you to make it clearer. There it is in perspective within an organism. And as you can see, that in this particular case, its actual position, its actual position is actually in, in contextualized. So it's the inner tube of life. It goes from the mouth to the anus. It's nine meters long. It has a surface area of a badminton court. It's not a smooth tube in most part. It has many finger-like projections to capture nutrients and absorb them into the blood. So it's actually compacted. And it is able to be compacted because of the twists and turns here. Okay. That is why it can fit so nicely into our bodies. And all this was uh, actually, um, uh, there was a lecture by this man, whose picture I have here, Simon Carding. Simon Carding you'll hear quite a bit about. Simon Carding belongs to the Institute for Food Research in Norwich, in England. And he is a gut man. I have been, for a better part of my career, a stomach man. So I was into one organ. Carding is more interested in the intestines. So what we will do for the next few days is we will talk about starting at the mouth. So we'll talk about how the mouth breaks up food particles. And it assists, of course, in producing spoken language. But we're not going to go there. And it has these salivary glands that moisten and lubricate food. It has enzymes which digest food. And uh, what it doesn't do is ultimately break the food into its smallest components. When the food leaves the mouth and travels down the esophagus, which is a, f a transporting tube, it's still in big pieces. It hasn't broken up into, into tiny, tiny, tiny little <coughs> fragments. Okay. Now, once the food gets to the stomach, that's going to be very interesting to talk about. This is a remarkable organ. Most textbooks say the stomach is a storage organ. We don't believe it. L a lot happens in the stomach. And the stomach is actually a tumble dryer. The mixing takes place there all the time. And you know what is remarkable, ladies and gentlemen, is that while we're sitting here and digesting food, we feel no pain. The walls of the stomach don't get damaged. And I'll tell you in a minute why. But I also need to talk about 
the enzymes in the stomach. How come they can attack, attack the protein in the food, enzymes like pepsin, can attack the proteins in the food, break them up into little bits, and not turn against the wall of the stomach, which also has protein in it? It's remarkable. But most remarkable of all, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail, is that the stomach secretes the most potent acid imaginable. Take a drop of it from your stomach during peak meal time, during peak digestion time, and place a spot on your skin, and you'll burn a hole through your skin. And yet your stomach survives this three times a day at least. And if you're like me, so at five or six times a day. <laughs> so it, it's absolutely remarkable. And, and, and so what, what we're saying is this might be a long tube extending from the mouth to the anus. But along the way, it has all these specialized organs that do different things, that have different environments, right? Have completely different environments. Like the stomach, after the food leaves the stomach, it goes into the duodenum, entering the small intestine. Now, if you think about that, that stomach, that food, then enters a completely different environment from the one in the stomach. Okay? And then, of course, somewhere in that region is a little entry duct which brings something from the liver and something else from the pancreas. So the liver and the pancreas have their own ducts and then they join up to form a common duct which enters the small intestine. It specifically the duodenum. It enters the duodenum and there continues the process of digestion. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. So from the small intestine then, we will then talk about, well, we'll talk about what the pancreas contributes, the hormones that regulate blood glucose levels, the bicarbs that neutralize the stomach acid, the trypsin and the chymotrypsin, which are the enzymes which digest the proteins. And then in the contribution from the liver would be in the form of bile. And those bile salts are absolutely essential for digestion. And so your food's on the way, and now it's heading for the large intestine, right? So now, in the large intestine, you start getting your absorption. And whatever else that you leave out and which is unable to be absorbed are your fecal pellets, which you expel at great pressure and can still stand up and not think about, wow, my, I did it and my gut didn't get jam damaged. <laughs> so one important thing is if you look at any textbook, any medical textbook, you will find that right from the mouth, right up to the anus, there's a very thin layer. When I say thin, I'm talking about microns. A micron is a 10 to the minus 6 of a meter. Micron. So there's a very thin layer of about 150 microns all along the wall of the gut, a layer of mucus. And the textbooks say it's a mere lubricant. I'm telling you, I'm telling you that it's not. It's far more than that. It's one of the most important secretions in the gut. And you know why I'm saying that? I'm the only mucus specialist in Africa. <laughs> so I will be talking to you a little bit about mucus. But some years ago, I did give one or two, I think two lectures at some school on mucus, and some of you might have been there, I'm not sure. But the amazing thing about it is that such a thin layer allows your food to travel down through the gut. It allows your hard fecal pellets to be expelled through the anus. Everything just slides through, and while it sits there, it protects against any enzyme, any enzyme in any part of your gut, which is breaking down food 
and if decides to turn against your gut wall, the mucus blocks it off. So you should say, thank God for mucus. And of course, I just wanted to tell you that although the gut has its own intrinsic nerve supply, although the gut has its own intrinsic nerve supply, and I mean its own nerve supply, and it doesn't really need your central nervous system, there is a link between the central nervous system and the gut. And the main nerve that goes from the brain to the gut is called the vagus nerve. There was a time when ulcer patients used to have a vagotomy. They used to cut off the vagus nerve. Because doctors at that time used to think that, oh, you've got ulcers, so you're probably secreting too much acid. And you're secreting too much acid because of your vagus nerve that's sending down messages from the brain asking your stomach to produce more acid. So I think you should have a vagotomy and cut off the vagus nerve. They don't do that anymore. So the vagotomy was the treatment of choice for those with untreatable ulcers to cut acid production. It didn't affect gut function because the gut, although it wasn't known then, had its own nerve supply. The enteric nervous system can function without messages from the central nervous system. And there was a man by the name of Auerbach who found a complex network or plexus of nerve cells and fibers wedged between the two layers of muscle that encircle the gut. And he called it the myenteric plexus. Remember that, because I'm going to show that to you now. And another plexus in the submucosa is myosinous plexus. The gut from the submucosal tissue is very strong. You make surgical sutures from it, and you even make strings for your tennis rackets from it. Okay? So let's go and talk about the, we, we've been talking about the macro view of the gut. Let's talk about the micro. So the, the, the gut, or the tract wall has four layers, right? And I've listed them here, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa. And I'm going to tell you about them now. Now, I want you to imagine somebody holding up a gut like this, and I come along and I cut it across. Can you imagine that? So it's, it's being held here, it's dangled. And I come along with a nice sharp blade and I cut it across. And it breaks into two parts. Can you imagine that? Right. Now, then when you look inside it, you will see that that's the lumen of the gut. So that's where your food travels through. OK? That's the lumen. And then, and then just lining the lumen, lining the lumen, uh, is your epithe is your mucosa. Now that mucosa is made up of three parts. It has the mucous membrane, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. So I just want to show that to you again. So you have the mucous membrane there, then the submucosa, and then the muscularis mucosa. Can you see that layer there? That's a layer of muscle. OK, so that's the first big layer of the gut. Then the second layer, which is that one that's lighter in color, is the submucosa. So you have the mucosa and below it the submucosa. That's the one you make gut from. Okay, And then there is, there is the muscle layer called the muscularis externa, and it's made up of two layers of muscle. All right? So you might look at a gut and not know that it's made up of these four layers. But very importantly, if you look here, you will find that the submucosa has nerves, and the other region here on the outer side has nerves. So that myenteric plexus and myosinous plexus that I was talking about are just an aggregation of nerve cells. So the gut has everything it needs to function as an independent unit. So if you somebody very gently removed your gut from your body and placed it on this table, it'll go on contracting by itself. It doesn't need a brain to tell it what to do. It has an intrinsic quality of just merely contracting. Now, that doesn't happen with other organs. They always need a message from the brain. 
to perform their functions. The gut performs this function independently. And that's what's fascinating about it. Okay. Now, so here's just another view. So that's the lumen. Lumen meaning just the, the hole that you can walk through. Imagine you get into somebody's mouth and you just walk through their gut. And you come out on the other side. Not a very clean thought, but you can do that. So that's the lumen. That's the outer layer, the mucosa. And then under the muscle layer is the submucosa. And then these two muscle layers here. OK? So now, the gut has an inherent property. And that's called peristalsis. Now, what is that? It is the pressure-induced propulsive activity of the gut. Now, I got this from this man, Michael Gershon, who I'll talk to you about just now. It occurs without the involvement of the central nervous system. And due to the local nervous mechanism of the gut, its own internal neural system occurs in isolation. And it was shown in 1970 by this man, Ulrich Trendelenburg, I think he was German. No other organ has this property. The intrinsic nervous system of the gut actually has properties that are like those of the brain. And Gershon says, the bowel is close to God. <laughs> and he's quite serious about it. OK, and it, this is from a book which I'm going to talk about just now. I have it here. OK, so I just want to explain this, this peristalsis, And I turn to Guyton, because I remembered that I read Guyton as an undergraduate to understand it. So if that is your gut, OK, the food, as it moves through, it didn't distends the gut. Once it has shifted position from, one, from here to there, that part constricts and actually propels the food forward. So after a few minutes, that part becomes constricted, and the next part dilates. And so it walks like that. The food ball walks like that through the gut. Now, if you look at a modern textbook, and you ask, well, what's the gut for? Then the textbook will say, oh, well, the gut is made of cells, which we know. Uh, and the proper function of these cells depends on maintaining the availability of water and various electrolytes. And then they said, cells make, cells make body systems. They should have first said, cells make organs, like I told you earlier, and then uh, systems. And then, so there's the organism, finally. And then that system, its main function is homeostasis. So it says the digestive system contributes to homeostasis by transferring nutrients, water, and electrolytes from the external environment to the internal environment. OK? Now, having said that, what is this homeostasis? It's a process whereby a system regulates itself. Think of yourself sometimes when you're sitting uh, on a cool evening after a hot day on your patio with your shoes off, with this lovely cold breeze blowing, and you think, ah, this world's a perfect place. Your body is in no way hindering your enjoyment of that moment, because everything in your system is working perfectly because of homeostasis. There is a regulation of every function inside your body. There are a million things going on inside which you're totally unaware of. Your heart is beating. You don't have to stop and say, hey, hang on. Before I enjoy the breeze, I have to ensure that my heart has its next beat. You don't have to worry. It's all being done. And it's all regulated. The heart mustn't beat too fast, or the kidney mustn't excrete too much waste material. Everything being regulated. And that's the simple, simple definition of homeostasis. The coordinated and largely automated physiological reactions required to maintain steady internal states in a living organism. It describes the automatic regulation of temperature. Remember, you mustn't go too much above 37 degrees, and you mustn't go too much lower than 37 degrees. Oxygen concentration must be perfect, otherwise you die. Or the acidity of your bloodstream has to be in the region of seven. If anything happens that would threaten these things, 
there's a thermostat in the brain which will detect that and try and make amends to bring things back to what you call normal. So you are a highly regulated system. The ensemble work of the nervous, endocrine and immune systems produces homeostasis. Emotions are part and parcel of the regulation we call homeostasis. So if suddenly one of you had some bad news, and you say, oh my God, what am I going to do? And suddenly you're not functioning. You might even forget that, you, that you're in a lecture hall with a whole lot of other people. You might jump up or you might bang the desk. It's because your homeostatic regulation has been affected. And the, 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 the function of the brain and all your organs at that point is to return you to a situation where you are functioning normal again. So, this man, Antonio Damasio, said, I propose that homeostasis is a key to the biology of consciousness. But we were not going to discuss that. I just put it in there because I love his writing. Okay, so the processes of the gut. You ingest the food, you propel it through peristalsis. The gut keeps relaxing and contracting. There's digestion along the way, starts in the mouth, increases in the stomach, continues in the intestines. And then there's... So there's that mechanical digestion, because the gut is continually, continually pushing things through. That's mechanical. And then, of course, the chemical digestion with the use of enzymes in an acidic environment, enzymes in an alkaline environment. We'll talk about that as we go on. And of course, then, the absorption of the nutrients that you need. That happens in your intestines. And then, of course, what you can't absorb, you expel. Okay, so those are broad functions of the gut, which is a con continuous muscular digestive tube, breaks the food into smaller fragments, it absorbs the digested material, and it eliminates waste. So, as I said, there's the, you have to obtain the food, you have to propel it, and then you have to digest it both mechanically and chemically, and send it through the gut, and along the way, the valuable nutrients get picked up and absorbed and sent into the bloodstream. Now, so this physical and chemical digestion which breaks down food to molecular fragments or monomers, we will discuss. So if you take a protein, if you've eaten something which has a protein in it, your, the intention of the gut is to break that protein down into its building blocks, called amino acids. The intention of your gut is to break down the fat into fatty acid and glyceride. The intention of your gut is to break down your long polymer chains of carbohydrates into monosaccharides like glucose and galactose. All right? We'll talk about that. Now, the absorption is a movement of nutrients across the mucosal membrane into the blood or the lymph. It's the process by which contents of the small bowel enter the mucosal epithelial cells and eventually the portal vein or lymphatics. So I showed you that picture. The first layer is a layer of epithelial cells lining the lumen. Those absorb the nutrients and send those nutrients. By nutrients, I mean your amino acids, your monosaccharides, your fatty acid and glycerol are then sent into the circulation. They enter the circulation they call it the portal circulation, which goes directly to the liver. Now, the liver has a multitude of functions. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, I, when I talk to you about it in more detail, I hope it will fascinate you as much as it's fascinated me. About three years ago, I was lying in intensive care in a UCT private hospital. And it was evening, and I think I was feeling drowsy and about to fall off to sleep. The ward was quiet for a change because the intensive care wards can be very noisy. And then I could overhear the nurses. We're all huddled at one spot, the desk, and they were obviously very anxious. It sounded like they had a test on the next day. And that one kept nudging the other one and saying, but what is the function of the liver? Is it only one function? How many functions does the liver have? And when I heard this, I, I, I sort of rang the bell and said, I want all of you, I want all of you to come to my bedside. So they thought I was dying. And I was going to leave them something in my will, which I don't have. So anyway, I called them there and I said, 
I hear you talking about the liver. They said, yes, Professor, we have a test. I said, let me list you the functions of the liver. <laughs> and I did, and they were so grateful for it. And, and they were fascinated. They thought at some stage, some of them must have thought I was lying, because I went on and on and on. And that's the liver. It's got so many functions, OK? So defecation now, you know what it is about. And don't forget that protective barrier to the entry of pathogens and toxins into the cells lining the gut, thus preventing them from moving into the bloodstream. So there's that continu continuous layer of mucus right from the mouth to the anus. Now, when I started preparing this talk, I always like to go to the beginning. So I went to the scriptures, which elevates the living human body. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. That was in the Holy Bible, Genesis 1, 26. I hope there's nobody from the church here. Priests, no? I don't want to misquote. Uh, if I misquote the Quran, I know Mr. Kaji will object. <laughs> In the Quran, it says, we have indeed created man in the best of molds. Now, that's interpreted in many ways. But usually, the imam will tell you that what Allah is saying in the Quran is that man is his highest creation. Right? So mold could mean symmetry, form, nature, constitution. There is no fault in Allah's creation, according to the Quran. To man, Allah gave the purest and best nature. If he uses his God-given will and discretion wrongly, he falls even lower than the beasts. That happens to us every day, so we know about that. Right. Now the scientific revolution comes along. And in 1543, Copernicus says, the Earth is not the center of the universe. In fact, the universe is 13.4 billion years old something we can't even imagine in time. And our planet, which we thought was the center of the universe, is just a pale blue dot, which is about 5 billion years old, in a far corner of a far-flung galaxy. It's a, it's a little suburb, a huge <laughs> galaxy. And these are not very nice thoughts. I don't think science has done humanity any favors in that regard. And then Charles Darwin comes along, and his, his Origin of the Species and his subsequent works tells us we are mere animals. <laughs> Never mind what the scriptures said about the high, being the highest form of creation. You fit very nicely into the animal kingdom. And we, humans, are 200,000 years old, not 6,000 or 5,000. And we share a common ancestry with Every other living form and apes are our closest relatives. Now that's, that's the thought that gets a lot of my religious friends in a, into a frenzy. Because the minute you mention evolution, the first question you ask is, do you think I've come from monkeys? <laughs> but that statement is completely and utterly wrong. And I've debated this in the Muslim newspapers, that nobody said you came from a monkey. Nobody came from a monkey. We share a common ancestry with an ape, but we share a common ancestry with a rabbit, with a squirrel, with a porcupine, and with an ant. Because as I showed you earlier, we all started as a single cell four billion years ago. So, but anyway, science put us in our place and said, don't think you're up there. You're probably down there. And then Richard Dawkins, of course, who never fails to annoy everybody, <laughs> comes along in 19... 1976, done it? 1976, with this book, which was a turning point, turning point in the history of biology, the selfish gene, in which he says, you know what you are? You're just a vehicle for which genes use you to multiply and make copies of themselves. So what do you do? You're a human being because you're produced by human beings. The genes use you until you reproduce so they can be passed on, right? And you might s sit there and be very lyrical and romantic and find a lot of meaning in your life. And you can go and find all the meaning you want. That's good for you. Because then you'll be happy and you'll reproduce. And you'll pass on your genes to, some, uh, to the next generation. So you are just being used by the selfish gene to make copies of itself. 
Now that's not a very nice thought for someone who was told by God that you are of the highest, highest order. So, if the human has fallen, then the gut must fall. <laughs> and so, Michael Gershon wrote this groundbreaking new understanding of nervous disorders of the stomach and the intestine. And what did he call the gut? The second brain. That was, that is now, that is now really something. And that is only because of all the explanation I gave you about the intrinsic nervous system in the gut. So, Gershon writes this book, and he's fascinated by this whole idea. So why do I say the gut has fallen? Because man has fallen. Science has taken man, and or, or, or woman, sorry, human beings, I should be more politically correct, and put them into the animal kingdom. So he says, consider the lowly gut and its nervous system. The bowel just is not the kind of organ that makes the pulse race. <laughs> no poet would ever write an ode to the interstate. <laughs> to be frank, the popular consensus is that the colon is a repulsive piece of anatomy. Now, you've seen pictures of it. It's quite right. It's quite true. The bowel is a primitive, slimy, snake-like thing. Its body lies coiled within the belly, and it slithers when it moves. In brief, the gut is reptilian, not at all like the brain, from which wise thoughts emerge. <laughs> Clearly, the gut is an organ only a scientist would love. I am such a scientist. <laughs> and I wish to share with you that I I'm such a scientist, because this is the stuff I work with. I should have warned you that you might need to turn away. I work with mucus. And this particular sample of mucus was got from a patient who ha originally had a cancer of the appendix. And the appendix bursts, and the cells disperse into the abdomen and produce that thick mucus. That's what kills the patient, not the cancer of the appendix, but the accumulation of this thick, viscous fluid in the abdomen, which then actually hampers the functioning of all your other organs in that region. It's called pseudomyxoma peritonea. It's actually very sad. There's no cure for this. Now, the professors who originally brought me to Cape Town, Professor Vilan Givas, let me show you, over there, whom I met the other night, Professor Rosemary Hickman, used to always say to me, Anwar, we don't want to see the material. We just want you to tell us your results, your data. But don't bring that stuff to us in the laboratory. And I always remind Professor Givers about it. I met him the other evening, and I said, Prof, can I talk to you about mucus? And he said, no, 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 I'm going to have some food now. So I must mention, I mean, this is a, a very special man uh, in my life the late Professor Solly Marx. Solly Marx was the head of the gastroenterology unit at Kuriskia Hospital. But he was a world authority on the gut, on many aspects of the gut. And he was the most sarcastic man I've met. And I've traveled a lot with Solly. I think this photograph was taken either in Hong Kong or Sydney. And Solly used to stand up at an international meeting and say to whoever was speaking, you're talking nonsense. <laughs> like when we talk about helicobacter causing ulcers, and we were there in Sydney when the announcement was made that there is a new factor that causes ulceration. It's not acidity, it's helicobacter. And Solly stood up and said, I don't believe a word of it. All the dogs in Cape Town have helicobacter, none of them have ulcers. And he said that. <laughs> so that was Solly Marx. And he could be a terrifying man. Now, when I first came here, very young, very scared, I had to go to Solly Marx to give him my project proposal. And he walked into the room, and I stood up, and I greeted him. And he sat, and he looked at me like this right through. Didn't smile. He said, so you're the mucus guy. <laughs> and then he said, yes, so what are you going to do? And I had this carefully laid out project, which I explained to him. And while I was talking to him, this man just stared at me. And at the end of it, when I had finished, of course, I breathed a sigh of relief. But I was waiting for a compliment from him, because I thought I had done a very good job. And he, all he said to me was, I'm afraid, my boy, you'll come to a sticky end just like your bloody mucus. <laughs> that was his first, first comment to me, I remember. We became very good friends. Um, and I do remember once traveling to 
some place in the United States uh, from London. And Solly had come from Cape Town, and I didn't know what time he was arriving. And what I didn't know is when I got to the reception desk at the hotel, Solly was standing behind me. He didn't give me any indication. And then the receptionist said, how did you travel, sir? And I was going to tell him, well, I came via Pan Am or whatever it was in those days. And so he said, he travels on slime. And I didn't have to, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to turn around to see that it was Solly Marx. <laughs> Wonderful. And so the gut is an extraordinary organ. So now from having, f it accounts for two thirds of our immune system, right? It extracts energy from food. It produces more than 20 unique hormones. And yet so little is taught about it in medical school. And gastroenterology is a subspeciality of medicine. There's so very few people who actually go into gastroenterology. And yet, if you go to E23, which is the gastroenterology division of the hospital, it's always filled with patients. People have all kinds of gut problems. So, it's probably unfair. I think it's, it's, it's a speciality that's not given its due. Now, so if the idea, we have to talk about pooing. If the idea of defecation contributed to the fall of the gut, because if you read Michael Gershon's explanation, he, what, he, what he didn't say is, of course, it produces this nasty substance called poo. If the idea of defecation contributed to the fall of the gut, then it is Michael Gershon and Julia Enders, who ironically used pooing to ensure that the gut returns to its rightful elevated status. Because she, Julia Enders, says that pooing is a masterly performance. <laughs> and Gershon, you've already heard, saying the bowel is close to God. So after having fallen, the gut is beginning to rise. It's ironic that we use the process of pooing to see it rise. <laughs> okay, so this is new book. I was walking out of Waterstones in London in, in July last year, uh, very frustrated, very angry with the prices of books, and, and always calculating pounds to rands and saying, oh my God, if my wife saw the price of this book, she'd kill me. And as I was walking out, you know, there was this table full of just books thrown on it, and I pick up this book called Gut, right? How a book about our guts has become a surprise bestseller, breaking the poo taboo. <laughs> so Julia Enders is a German microbiology student who talks to Simon Osborne about the beauty of intestines and the masterly performance that is defecation. And of course, uh, Simon Osborne was from The Independent, the newspaper. Okay, and this is the book. And she says the gut is the body's most underrated organ. Her, a cousin of hers asked her, Julia, you study medicine. How does pooing work? This unspectacular, this is what Julia says in the book, this unspectacular daily necessity turned out to be far more sophisticated and impressive than I ever would have imagined. Every time we go to the loo, it's a masterly performance. <laughs> and it's on page 10. You can read it. Buy the book and read it. Okay, so this is the most important feature of our lives. And that's a picture of your toilet roll. Now, how does it work and why? That's an important question. So it involves two nervous systems working tirelessly in tandem to dispose of our waste as discreetly and hygienically as possible in more admirably and orderly a manner than other animals. It involves the functioning of two sphincters, an inner and an outer sphincter in the anus. The two sphincters have sensor cells in between. So here's one sphincter, the anus, the inner one, and there's the outer one. Now, here comes the avalanche. But now, but now, the anus has to decide whether you go to run to the toilet or it's merely a wind. Sorry, I have to speak openly about this. This is a gut, okay? So a sphincter. This sphincter, both of them are sphincters, is a cylindrical muscle that normally maintains constriction of a natural body passage or orifice and which relaxes as required by normal physiological function. So sphincters can close off an organ. We'll talk about that tomorrow when we talk about the stomach. And it can relax and let things pass through. Now, so waste removal. When the waste reaches the internal sphincter, and now you do know 
that's the internal sphincter. When the waist is about to get there, what happens? The muscle's reflex is to open. But it does not just open the floodgates and let the outer sphincter deal with the avalanche. It lets a taster. It's an unfortunate use of word. <laughs> this is her, her language, not mine. It lets a taster through, and the sensor cells in between the sphincters send the message to the brain, which says, it's only a wind, relax. <laughs> or time to go to the toilet, run. Okay. So sphincters work together then to allow defecation to happen. That's the masterly performance. So we expel one to four liters of gas every day. Global warming, we could be causing it. <laughs> 60% of the poo is bacteria, and now we're going into a topic which is becoming an extremely exciting topic for gastroenterological researchers throughout the world. Are you tired, or can I finish this lecture? Can I go on? Okay. Now, so happiness is the successful removal of waste. The best way to do it is to squat. So now you'll agree that the Indians have taught you something. <laughs> The natural pooing position for humans, 1.2 billion humans in the world do it this way, and I'm sure she's referring to India, <laughs> keeps the gut straight. The modern seat is unsatisfactory. The belly muscles get tense. Kinks are formed in the gut, like in a hose. You know the hose kinks? Straining can cause varicose veins. It's serious. Syncope, fainting, and even strokes. Eventually, diverticulitis which is a common problem. If the gut twists in such a way that eventually nothing passes through, hemorrhoids and constipation. Now, here it is. It shows you. Sit straight so you have a straight gut or else you'll have kinks. So, what, sorry, you all right? Yeah, you want to squat tonight? You can, yeah. <laughs> Whilst to poo is important, poo can cause serious problems. So once it's out of the body, can get serious. Now, help with the fight against disease. Now, in 1996, this was a special case history. A sick fisherman defecated into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's a common occurrence. It's not a trivial thing. People do that when they're out at sea. There was an epidemic of fever, vomiting, agonizing tummy cramps and diarrhea throughout the oyster bars in New Orleans. So you can see how these things spread. Fortunately, it was a calice virus and not cholera. But cholera is a problem in the New Orleans fish restaurants. I don't know if, how many of you here have been to New Orleans, to the French Quarter, where you can, you can buy, I mean, you can have all these cuisines, fish. And when I was preparing this talk, I must tell you this, I thought of this very, he was my very close friend when I worked in Newcastle in England. His name was David Hutton. He was an extremely nice man. He was part of our research group. But unfortunately, his project was on poo. And so he used to wait for poo samples from the hospital because he was extracting an enzyme from poo. And what he had to do is liquidize the poo. <laughs> and one day, I was sitting in an office adjoining the lab. I must have heard the liquidizer. And then suddenly, there was silence. And then I suddenly heard. David saying, God's bells, God's teeth. And I ran into the lab, and he was full of <laughs> Poor man. The top of the liquid eyes had flown up. <laughs> After that, I named him Shit Hutton. <laughs> okay. Now we're moving to a new era of gut research called the gut-brain axis. So. As I told you, the gut also possesses unimaginably a large number of nerves. It commands an entire fleet of signaling substances, nerve insulation materials, and ways of connecting. Only the brain can compete with the gut for diversity. Its network of nerves, called gut brain, because it is as large and chemically complex as the brain. Its complexity is not only for breaking wind, Simon Carding tells us. It is more than that. It has a huge surface area. It's the largest sensory organ in the body. The eyes, the ears, etc., are external senses dealing with the conscious mind. The gut deals with the subconscious mind. 
And yet, and I say this with apology, and this is from end 